Hi everybody. Um, so it's a real pleasure to give this lecture to the Royal Society of Tasmania um, as a recipient of the Peter Smith Medal. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to make an acknowledgement of country and acknowledge the Palawa Pakana people of Lutuita, the traditional owners of the land upon which we live and work. I pay my respects to elders past and present as the knowledge holders and sharers. And I stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about where I've come from to start with. So I studied exercise science at UTAS. I'm an exercise physiologist. And in 2011, I undertook an honours year at um, the Menzies Institute for Medical Research and then continued and um, completed my PhD with Professor Jim Sharman, shown in this picture here. I completed my PhD in 2016. And in 2017, I moved over to Paris in France, where I undertook two years of postdoctoral training with this group of researchers here. In 2020, I moved back to Australia and moved to the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne, where I worked with the sports cardiology research team. And in 2021, I moved back to Tasmania and back to the Menzies Institute, and I'm now starting to build my own little um, research team there. So my research has all focused on cardiovascular disease, and this is because cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death both here in Australia and worldwide. And in fact, one Australian dies every 12 minutes from cardiovascular disease. As, um, as well as the significant health um, burden associated with cardiovascular disease, there's significant economic burden also associated with the condition. And um, in Australia, we spend $11.8 billion annually um, on cardiovascular disease. So as an exercise uh, physiologist and with a passion for prevention of chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, my work has all um, used tools and approaches that can identify individuals at the asymptomatic stage of disease development so that we can potentially um, prevent these individuals from going on to develop overt cardiovascular disease. And to do this, I've focused on markers of um, vascular aging or blood vessel aging. And this is because we can um, often see damage in the blood vessels um, before someone presents with overt cardiovascular disease. So if we can see that they're already um, at risk of uh, cardiovascular disease based on the health of their blood vessels, then we're able to um, implement preventative strategies earlier on in um, the disease progression. So vascular aging refer refers to the deterioration in vascular structure and function over time, which leads to organ damage in the heart, brain and kidney. And here you can see an image of a blood vessel and how it changes um, with the progression of disease. Um, so the early changes that occur in the blood vessels in, involve a stiffening of the blood vessel wall. And this is what we call arteriosclerosis. And as the disease progresses, we um, get an accumulation of um, plaque and inflammatory cells and um, eventually the lumen um, or the blood vessel becomes a lot narrower. And this is what we call atherosclerosis. <clears throat> And when I'm talking about vascular aging, I'm predominantly referring to arteriosclerosis, as this is the earliest changes that we see um, occurring in the blood vessel. So here we have an image of um, the heart, and it is the, um, the job of the left ventricle, um, which contracts so um, well, the whole heart contracts with every heartbeat, but it is the left ventricle that um, is responsible for propelling um, blood out into the rest of the circulation. So when the left ventricle contracts, it expels blood into um, the large elastic uh, blood vessels, um, namely the aorta, and this then distributes blood to the rest of the body. And under optimal conditions um, and in a healthy uh, system, those elastic arteries are able to distend 
and buffer an increase in blood pressure and flow that's generated with every contraction of the heart. However, in the presence of um, uh, risk factors or disease, um, we see a stiffening in the, in the blood vessels. So these normally compliant arteries are no longer able to buffer that increase in, in blood pressure and flow with every um, beat of the heart. And this happens with ageing. It is an ageing process, but also in the presence of risk factors such as elevated blood pressure, lipids, glucose, um, inactivity, and so on. And this has a number of consequences for cardiovascular health. So this image here shows the um, blood pressure um, waveform and, and um, the pulsatile nature of it. As you can see um, in, a, in a healthy elastic aorta, by the time that that blood pressure um, reaches the smaller arteries um, close to the organs such as the kidneys and the brain, we get a more steady flow of blood that is being delivered at this um, organ level. But in a stiff aorta, um, this uh, pressure waveform is highly pulsatile and we get an increase um, in pulsatility, which is transmitted to the microvasculature and can cause damage to these very um, vulnerable um, small blood vessels. And this um, can be particularly damaging to organs such as the brain, heart and kidney because they have a high demand for blood flow and uh, low resistance organs. So meaning that this a pulsatile pressure waveform can be transmitted directly to the microvasculature. And this um, vascular aging process is, a, is an aging process. And here you can see how it evolves over the life course. So, um, uh, individuals exposed to those risk factors that I mentioned early on in life um, develop what we call early vascular aging where they end up on this red trajectory and that means that these individuals are predisposed to earlier organ damage, um, earlier or premature cardiovascular disease and also mortality compared to someone who's on the average life course or better still on the ideal life course shown in green. And by measuring um, markers of vascular aging, we're able to really capture all of the damage done to the blood vessels over the life course by multiple risk factors. And this is um, as opposed to other more traditional risk factors such as blood pressure shown in blue here, or glucose and lipids le levels um, <clears throat> shown in green and, and black which tend to fluctuate over time and uh, can fluctuate between uh, visit to visit with the GP, for example. So by measuring um, vascular aging, we're really able to get a holistic view of all of the damage done by all of these risk factors on the blood vessel, rather than just focusing on one marker at a time. So during my PhD, I worked with patients with type two diabetes. And this is because type 2 diabetes is the fastest growing chronic disease in Australia. 80% of those with type 2 diabetes will die from cardiovascular disease. And we knew from the literature that vascular aging is accelerated in those with type 2 diabetes. However, we didn't know what um, impact this accelerated vascular aging in, in these individuals had on um, the organs such as the brain and the kidneys. So during my PhD, we looked at this association and we saw that um, those individuals um, with type two diabetes who had elevated um, levels of vascular aging had lower um, levels of gray matter volume. So um, this is um, <clears throat> indicative of impaired brain structure or cognitive impairment. So that, that higher level of vascular aging was associated with, with um, poorer outcomes in terms of uh, cognitive impairment. We also saw that um, individuals with type 2 diabetes who um, demonstrate uh, accelerated vascular aging also have impaired levels of kidney function. So these two studies were the first to really demonstrate this in patients with type 2 diabetes. 
And while it had been hypothesised that the mechanism um, explaining this link between early vascular ageing and organ damage um, was this transmission of that pulsatile waveform to the microvasculature, no study had actually confirmed this. Um, no study had actually measured it. So during my PhD, we also um, measured this. And we showed that this does indeed occur um, and leaves the kidneys and the brain crying out for help. So now I'm going to um, change uh, track slightly um, and talk more about childhood health. Um, and this is where my research is focused now. And the reason why I work um, in um, childhood health is because we now know that the risk for cardiovascular disease begins to develop in childhood. And this is um, particularly alarming, especially given the health of um, children worldwide these days. So, for example, 57% of today's children are predicted to be obese by the time they're 35 years of age. Um, hypertension in children and adolescents has increased by 75% from 2000 to 2015. And we're now seeing approximately 400 new cases of youth onset type 2 diabetes each year. So this is a condition that's normally diagnosed in adulthood, but we're now seeing it more and more prevalent in young people. And in um, Tasmania, we have some of the, the worst risk factors in children compared to other states of Australia. Um, so for example, 30% of Tasmanian children are overweight or obese compared to 25% nationally. 39% um, of children aged two to five years of age, 74% of those aged five to 12 years of age, and 92% of those aged 13 to 17 years of age um, do not meet the current requirements uh, for physical activity levels. Less than 10% um, of Tasmanian children are eating the required amounts of fruit and vegetables. And um, we can see um, that uh, nearly 100% of children aged two to eight years are consuming more than the upper limit of um, sodium or salt um, levels. So this is um, really quite concerning as all of these uh, risk factors uh, are risk factors for um, developing cardiovascular disease. Furthermore, we know that this early vascular aging process starts to develop in childhood. Um, and those individuals who are exposed to risk factors in childhood are set off on this trajectory of early vascular aging. So um, my team and I are conducting a, a number of um, projects, um, three major projects, um, to really address these poor risk factors in um, young people. So the first major project that we're working on is looking at um, determining um, the determinants of these unfavourable cardiovascular risk factors. Um, so really trying to understand the prevalence, how bad is this? Um, and what are the underlying causes of these unfavourable risk factors in young people? Um, so to do this, we are using epidemiological approaches using large um, databases. Um, in particular, we're working with um, European collaborators um, in this project called the EU Child um, Network Project, where we have access to data in um, almost 200,000 individuals. And we're also using data um, which has been uh, collected here locally in Australia by researchers from Menzies, um, the Childhood Determinants of Adult Health Study. So what have we found so far? Well, in one study um, where we were looking just at children in France, we identified that only 34% of children at the age of five had ideal levels of those cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and the main determinants were having ideal levels of these risk factors earlier on in life, so at age three, um, 
meaning that we could already see differences between healthy risk factors versus unhealthy risk factors at age three that then tracked to age five. And we know that this tracks into adulthood. So already at an early stage of life, we're already seeing um, significant differences um, in these risk factors between healthy and unhealthy individuals. We also observed that um, another main determinant were mothers who ate ideal levels of fish, vegetables and fruit, um, either pre-conception or, or during the pregnancy. And I should also mention here that we also observed that um, those individuals with poorer um, cardiovascular health at age five also had um, poorer IQ levels. And um, so this suggests that these risk factors are associated with um, neurological development. In another study that we're currently um, working on, so this is unpublished um, data um, using um, that data from the from the European cohort, um, where we've got um, 54,000 individuals included in this study, and we're looking at children aged about three years of age. Um, <clears throat> so these are some um, preliminary results of the uh, risk factors in a number of different um, studies from across Europe, so across um, three countries in Europe, um, France, the United Kingdom, and Spain. And as you can see, Already at age three, there are, um, you know, overweight and obesity is already quite um, prevalent in, uh, particularly in the United Kingdom and Spain, about 10% of children. And um, a significant amount of children are not meeting the guidelines in terms of healthy eating levels uh, across France, United Kingdom, and Spain. So this is quite significant. <clears throat> The next um, major project that my team and I are working on is um, trying to develop tools to identify those young people at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So again, we're using um, uh, big data um, sources and with the idea of early diagnosis. So trying to identify those at risk um, so that we can uh, implement preventative strategies. And to do this, we have set up an international research consortium called the Youth Vascular Consortium. So the um, Youth Vascular Consortium was established in 2020 by um, myself and, and my team and is an international consortium to investigate vascular ageing in children, adolescents and young adults. Currently, we have um, 35 research groups worldwide who are involved in the project. Um, and we have data on uh, approximately 43,000 um, individuals. And this is our website here, um, the youthvascularconsortium.com, if you're interested in finding out more. <clears throat> and um, the aim of this consortium is, and what we're currently working on, is to uh, develop reference values for what is normal vascular ageing in young people and what is pathological um, vascular ageing, because we don't know um, this currently. We're also uh, working to identify determinants of early vascular ageing in young people and to perform a head-to-head -head comparison of different techniques used to um, determine vascular age in young people so that we can um, determine what is the best method um, to identify vascular aging or early vascular aging in this population. And the final um, major project that my team and I are working on is um, working here locally in Tasmania to develop strategies to prevent um, these unfavourable risk factors from occurring in the first place. So specifically, 
we are working with the local um, community here in Tasmania to co-design solutions to improve the cardiovascular risk factors of children who come from areas of social disadvantage. Um, and the reason why we're focusing on areas of social disadvantage is because um, individuals who come from these areas have higher rates of chronic conditions, shorter life expectancies, more health risk factors and a greater burden of disease. We conducted a scoping review of um, programs addressing these risk factors in young people across Australia. And we identified over 150 programs that are either currently ongoing or recently completed. Now, a number of these programs, uh, a, a large proportion of these programs um, focused on a single risk factor. Um, they did not um, include any form of evaluation. So they um, it was hard to tell from these programs what impact they're actually having on these risk factors. And they didn't involve any co-design. So they didn't involve um, working with the local communities to develop their programs. Um, so that's um, a novelty of this, this work that we're doing. So we are partnering with um, key stakeholders, um, including clinicians, pa um, pediatricians, and the Heart Foundation, Department of Health, and, and so on, um, to develop this um, uh, intervention to address these risk factors. We're <clears throat> targeting children of about 12 years of age and their families. And this is so um, the children can be involved in the co-design process and help us to design um, interventions that are relevant to them. And we're currently applying for further research funding to support this project. So if anyone knows of any, please let me know. So in summary, cardiovascular disease remains a huge health and economic burden in Australia. And we now know that the risk starts to develop in childhood. So my team and I are working to understand the determinants of risk factors in young people, develop tools to identify those at increased risk and working with the local community to prevent the risk factors from developing in the first place. Ultimately, Ultimately, we hope that this work can contribute to directing these children and their families, particularly those who come from areas of social di disadvantage, towards a more healthier um, trajectory in life. So finally, um, I would just like to acknowledge the, the following people um, who've played a huge role in all of this research um, and in my um, research career to date. A number of um, mentors and supervisors, my team members, um, collaborators, the study participants, my um, partner and family, and all of the research funding um, that I've received. So thank you very much. And I know there were a few questions that were submitted. So, okay, so the first um, <clears throat> question was, how do we define the average vascular aging life course um, versus early and ideal vas um, vascular aging? So um, <clears throat> the... Um, to do this, we have some reference intervals and they're based on um, one particular measure of vascular aging called arterial stiffness. Um, and those reference intervals have been um, developed based on a, a large cohort of adults, about 20,000 adults, um, where they defined um, the median value based on age and sex as the average um, vascular aging and then above and below that as early and um, or ideal vascular aging. Another question that was asked was, how do we measure vascular aging? Um, and currently, uh, that's a, a good question. We, we are currently measuring it in a research setting and we don't really measure it in a clinical setting. And this is because the um, technology still needs to be developed so that it can be used more easily in a clinical set setting. But in the research setting, the main um, measure of vascular aging to, uh, to measure arterial stiffness 
is um, a technique called um, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. And this involves um, the measurement of the speed at which the pressure wave travels from the carotid artery in the neck to the femoral artery in the uh, leg, the top of the leg. And this gives us an indication of the speed at which the blood is flowing down the aorta as the aorta runs at, um, down the middle of our, of our bodies. Um, another question that was asked was whether we have um, any examples of successful interventions that um, have been identified. So um, referring to our third project. And we are currently, um, as I mentioned, the, the scoping review that we have conducted, we're currently writing this up. Um, we, because uh, only a small number of those programs were evaluated, only about 25 percent of those programs were evaluated, it is hard to tell what has actually been effective. Um, we are still digging into that data, so we don't know just yet, but um, once we get through those evaluations, um, I think we'll be able to tell um, which programs have been effective, if any. Um, another question that was asked was, um, how do other chronic disease um, diseases such as asthma or cancer in, ch in childhood impact cardiovascular disease later in life? Um, and again, this is a really good question. Um, we know that those individuals who have chronic diseases such as um, diabetes, so type 1 and type 2 diabetes in in um, uh, childhood have an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease later in life. Um, they already start to show um, abnormalities in terms of um, cardiac structure and function um, at a young age, which is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease later in life. Um, in terms of cancer, there's a lot of research emerging now um, in terms of the cardio-oncology um, research space whereby those individuals who are cured from their cancer may actually end up um, dying due to cardiovascular disease. And this is because um, of the cardiotoxic um, implications of, of their cancer treatment. And um, we're seeing this certainly in adults and there is now emerging research in um, young people as well. So I believe that was most of the questions that were submitted. Um, thank you very much for your attention.